Um, I hope you're having a wonderful Sunday. I'm Colleen Quinn. I'm from the University of Tampa. And today we'll be hearing from these four lovely presenters. First is Angela Murphy from Valencia College with St. Sebastian Bound to Antiquity. Then we have uh, Jihan Shin from Valencia College, Shadow of Mind, Hall of Soul, understanding the classical and post-war elements of Castile on the Shore. And then we have Patrick Wheeler from Santa Fe College. He's doing the importance of social class, the analysis of Brooks Beverly Hills, Chicago, and Diaz's How to Do a Brown Girl, Black Girl, and Girl are Happy. And then finally, but not least, we have Allison McLean from Jacksonville University doing Benny and Benny. So do a round of applause. Good morning. Um, Janet's passing out a, a print of the art piece that I'm going to be talking about this morning. Uh, this is uh, St. Sebastian. It's painted by Andrea Montagna. It's housed in the Louvre Museum and it's eight feet by four and a half feet. So this is my paper, St. Sebastian Bound to Antiquity. The term Renaissance defines an era between 1400 and 1600 when a reawakening of the classical values of the past became central to the concepts of knowledge and art. Four categories personify the entire period. Humanism, individualism, classicism, and secularism. Classicism specifically embraces the replication of aspects of antiquity through art, structure, or even tales of heroism. Saint Sebastian, Saint Sebastian, circa 1480, painted by Andrea Mantegna, shows Renaissance classicism by capturing Greek and Roman antiquity using style, detail, and proportion. Andrea Mantegna painted three versions of Saint Sebastian but the version that is housed in the Louvre is the personification of classicism blended with Christianity. The Saint Sebastian in the Louvre by expression of his head and the way he rises above his brutal executioners is an embodiment of Christian faith that Mantega never surpassed. Classicism is shown through the column, but the expression of despair on Saint Sebastian's face and equally disturbing the look of resentment on the executioner's faces when St. Sebastian refuses to die, cries out to the emotions of sympathy and pity. Allegory was used to depict symbolism in paintings or literature. Renaissance paintings used elements of all kinds, which separately seem disjointed, but together create a cohesive definition to the painting as a whole. Every painting defined by classicism has ancient images whose meanings may be disguised within the work. Antigna was a master of antiquity through classicism. Antigna had a practice of painting unrealistic images and objects in a precarious nature, but Sebastian was not fictionalized. He was a real man who ascended to sainthood, through martyrdom, and heroism is one of the virtues of classicism. Sebastian was a soldier of the Roman army who was also a Christian. Roman Emperor Diocletian was unaware that Sebastian was Christian and was also unaware that Sebastian was converting other Romans to Christianity. When Emperor Diocletian discovered this, he ordered Sebastian to be executed. The image of Sebastian pierced by the multiple arrows of his executioners is the attempt to follow the emperor's orders. But he did not die. And the emperor decreed the order for a second time, and this time St. Sebastian did die. He was actually stoned to death. Many people were revered to sainthood, and many were portrayed in paintings during the Renaissance. Each saint had to be shown with the element unique to them so that individuals would know who was being depicted. St. Sebastian was known by his arrows. Many versions of this saint were painted, and he is always depicted with his attributes, multiple arrows, yet he is still alive. In each case, he is also tied to a tree, or in this case, an elaborate column. But Mantegna's column is no ordinary column. This is a Greek classical order column with a composite capital, which became favorites of the Romans. 
In Mantegna's version, St. Sebastian being tethered to a beautifully detailed Greek column is classicism exhibited front and center. But this column was classical in even more ways than the image shows. Mantegna showed Sebastian tied not to a post or a tree, as was traditional, but to a classical column. This transposition not only situates the story in the time of Diocletian, but it also it enabled Mantegna to elaborate upon the theme of Christian victory. The column Sebastian is tied to is not just a column. It once formed part of an arcade in what seems to have been a Roman basilica, which is to say a ruined tribunal or a place of judgment. St. Sebastian is bound to the column by the rope. The rope binds St. Sebastian to the central theme, and St. Sebastian is therefore anchored to antiquity. The pedestal upon which St. Sebastian is standing is Greek in design, and this is an apparent link to antiquity, but the significance of the pedestal goes much deeper than mathematics. The cubical form was known for stability, and to that end, it was used in the Renaissance to display the same solidity, but also to elevate on the pedestal to a level of honor and preserve the moment captured in the image to thought and admiration. St. Sebastian's presence upon the pedestal indicates his importance in antiquity, and honor is conveyed upon him. He was held in high esteem among Renaissance citizens, and artists capitalized on this. Conversely, the positioning of the executioner's archers below St. Sebastian creates an unmistakable perspective and draws the viewer into the scene. The presence of the two archers in the De Soto and Sue view of the saint bring the image closer to the spectator. De Soto and Sue is an Italian phrase that refers to the idea of looking up from below that is similar to foreshortening. The depiction of what appears to be a death scene is an aspect of Saint Sebastian that should not be overlooked. Portrayal of death was common in art, but death of saints is not necessarily the correct implication. The scene is more a depiction of his survival than of his death, although it is difficult to overlook the number of arrows in the arrangement on St. Sebastian's body. Symbolism of the arrows is they are not merely a weapon, but traditionally the carriers of disease, especially the plague. For this reason, St. Sebastian's survival of the numerous arrows also implies he is the protector against the plague, and since he is concerned with the disease, yet does not carry it from it. St. Sebastian is presented contraposto in the perfect human <coughs> ratio. Mantegna captured the true meaning of classicism through per proportionate human form, and the product is realism. The painting is eight feet tall, and St. Sebastian takes up the same space on the painted surface as the average height of a man from this time in history. This shows the true genius of Andrea Mantegna. He not only used foreshortening, but also life-size anatomy to draw the viewer up to the subject. The arches are Roman in design. Andrea Mantegna loved to depict antique buildings and especially ruins. He was not the only artist to use Roman arches to display classicism, but his arches were more archaeologically accurate and forming unity within the painting. His love of ar archaeology is also <coughs> shown through his use of caves, another image of symbolism. Antigna knew the destruction of antiquity was a terrible tragedy, but he and other Renaissance artists knew that the demise of their creators was virtuous, the Renaissance was no longer a time of pagan ideals, but was not entirely God-centered either. Andrew Mantegna and Renaissance artists loved any aspect of antiquity and conveyed this through classicism, which inherently exemplified the beauty and culture of antiquity, but allegorically, Christian faith was also depicted to glorify the downfall of the pagan society.
On August 15, 1945, Emperor Hirohito announced to the public Japan's surrender, signaling the end of the Second World War. This dual voice broadcast, played to the radio by a phonograph, was the first time the Emperor had directly addressed the people. The announcement shattered an ideology founded on ultranationalism and marked a significant change in Japanese society, politics, and culture. Hiroki Murakami is among many authors of the immediate post war generation to attempt a reconciliation of classical aesthetic and the defeated mentality of a modern post war state. The premise of Kafka on the Shore is easy. 15 year old Kafka Tamara runs away from home, but the telling of the tale is far from simple. Kafka on the Shore's complexity stems from the combined influence of Western tragedy and conventional Japanese culture. The novel bears the inimitable signature of Murakami's imagination. Like the Wind Up Bird Chronicle, Norwegian Wood, and Hardwood Wonderland in the Other World, there are the usual inclusions of cats and classical music to the text. Murakami still discusses the themes of alienation, nostalgia, and living in a Japan torn between its like war legacy and the violence it has endangered in today's youth. The narrative makeup of Kafka on the Shore, however, has a different texture compared to his older brothers. Unlike purposely, purposefully modern Norwegian Wood and surrealistic film noir, Hardwood Wonderland at the End of the World, Kafka on the Shore clashes together classical Greek and Japanese sensibilities, Shakespeare, existentialist philosophy, and a great deal of sex. The ubiquitous post-war mentality adds extra weight to the story. Divided egos reflect every in, in every character throughout the text. Out of the entire cast of kitschy, twisted, violent, and love-starved characters, Oshima has the greatest clarity. Oshima is intersex, transgender, and homosexual. Ostensibly, he should be the, part, the character most difficult to understand. However, he drops truths into the text easily and gently. The darkness of the outside world has, van has vanished, but the darkness in our hearts remains virtually unchanged, and that estrangement sometimes creates a deep contradiction or confusion within us. He correctly diagnoses the fractured identity of both Kafka Tamura and the malady of modern Japanese youth. The violence embedded in postmodern generational culture is very real. The strange breakage between spirit and body in the novel's universe allows for different forms of the boy. In his waking hours, Kafka is a quiet, bookish runaway, afraid of his father and, and his fate. In the spirit world, Kafka murders his father, rapes his pseudo sister Sakura, and engages in sexual intercourse with his mother, Masaki. It seems as if his father's prophecy was inescapable after all, but only if one accepts every narrative of Kafka on the shore as realistic and true. Kafka himself is an unreliable narrator, admitting it's hard to tell the difference between sea and sky, between voyager and sea, between reality and the workings of the heart. It is a matter of little surprise that Kafka professes to love books. His divided identity must find it comforting and fascinating to slot into a prepared universe of easily resolved conflict and straightforward narrative. In this difficult narrative condition, Oshima serves a function akin to Tiresias and Oedipus Rex. Their conversations drive the intended messages of their respective works home to the audience. Lion Tiresias, transformed into a woman by the gods for seven years, sees beyond the confines of the stage and the mortal script. Oshima is perfectly aware of the howling emptiness inside modern youth. Quote, Why did God do that? Divide people into two? You got me. God works in mysterious ways. That's the whole wrath of God thing, all that excessive idealism and so on. My guess is it was punishment for something, like in the Bible, Adam and Eve in the fall and so forth. Original sin, I said. That's right, original sin. Oshima holds his pencil between his middle and index fingers, twirling it ever so slightly as if testing the balance. Anyway, my point is that it's really hard for people to live their lives long. This discourse hinges on Oshima's paraphrasing Aristophanes' speech in Plato's Symposium. Oshima quotes from various literary sources throughout the novel, telling Kafka, you discover something about that work that tugs at your heart. Or maybe we should say the work discovers you. While Kafka's emotions and mental health become plagued with insecurities, some native to puberty and others due to his father's prophetic curse, Oshima speaks with a surprising degree of awareness, gently reminding Kafka that every one of us is losing something precious to us. Lost opportunities, lost possibilities, feelings we can never get back again. That's part of what it means to be alive. He solemnly reminds Kafka that at the end of the novel, people need a place they can belong. Oshima speaks with the measured confidence of a man who knows himself. Perhaps this is why his message is so pure. He has already found himself and a place in the library. There's only one Oshima in either world of the novel. There are no other equivalents. He is irreplaceable in stark contrast to Nakata and Kafka, who correspond to each other at odd intervals. The mythology of the work is solidly Japanese, comprised of folk local folklore, classical Shinto texts, Buddhist philosophy, and historical accounts. 
its struggles with the post-war identity that haunts Kafka and Shore like a guilty conscience. Dualism is a prominent concept in, Jap in classical Japanese works. One can trace this theme and its variations to Kojiki, the definitive text of Japanese mythology. When Kafka chooses to run away to Shikoku, an island written with characters signifying two names, he is fulfilling the dictates of both modern storytelling, plot, and tradition. In traveling, both Kafka and Sakira would find adherence to the saying, in traveling, a companion, in life, compassion, difficult. Since the post-war guilt and postmodern sense of disposition runs through both boy and girl. Quote, it feels like everything's been decided in advance, that I'm following a path somebody else has already mapped out for me. It doesn't matter how much I think this over, how much effort I put into it. In fact, the harder I try, the more I lose my sense of who I am. It's like my identity is in orbit that I've strayed far away from, and that really hurts. Through carefully constructed scenes, Murakami ensures Nakata wears Egisu like a mask, like Kaka Tamura wears Oedipus. The Japanese aesthetic is a unique combination of Shinto and Buddhist principles. Due to the intricacies of language, native Japanese audiences are equipped with the natural advantage of innately understanding the linguistic and cultural depths of Kaka and Shore. The Japanese sphere of aesthetics has survived two world wars, countless skirmishes with foreign cultures, and political pillory, while remaining identifiably original. Wabi, the value of understated beauty. Sagi, the quality of older antique things. Iki, a form of refined style. And Mono no Awa, the sorrow of, of temporary things, all remain a central part of Japanese quotidian life. Junichiro Tanizaki, whose translation of the Heian classic, The Tale of Genji, plays a prominent role in connecting the very themes of Kafka and Shore and describes native aesthetic thusly. We tend to seek our satisfactions in whatever surroundings we happen to find ourselves to content ourselves with things as they are. And so darkness causes us no discontent. We resign ourselves to it as inevitable. If light is scarce, the light is scarce. And we will immerse ourselves in the darkness and there discover its own particular beauty. He further discusses this attitude in the modern world, arguing that no theater is one of the few aesthetic traditions left in its distilled and classical form. No is a form of theater fusing together here and there street entertainment and high court plays. There are numerous mentions in Kafka on the Shore to the No. Kafka Tamura's family name is the name of the play in the No repertoire. Tamura is the second in a trilogy of plays, the Katyashura, a type of play which features a warrior who won a battle. Kafka Tamura certainly wins that fight by the end of the novel. Tanazaki takes particular consideration in describing darkness when applied to the No state, insisting that this sense of beauty would vanish into the harsh glare of modern floodlamps. These shadows provide an ominous atmosphere. Kafka, surrounded by the naked woods, similarly stripping himself of his fears and reservations, passes by two soldiers guarding the true depths of the forest. Better not look behind you, the Brani soldier says, in a clear reference to the tragedy of World War II. <coughs> they are relics of World War II, a time when the creative aesthetic was suspended in favor of military pursuits. Tanazaki's darkness, true darkness, not merely the lack of light, is the same kind of forest Kafka passes through preceding Kafka on the Shore's finale. Japanese legends describe Genji's death at Yashima Bay, another no connection, on the coast of Shikoku. With the spirit of Genji, Nakata, and Kafka, each find their way towards peace.
depending on her social class and ethnicity. In Gwendolyn Brooks' poem, Beverly Hills, Chicago, the speaker reflects on a past experience when he or she rode through an affluent neighborhood with a group of people. Their realization, however, that is only, that is only natural that it should occur to them how much more fortunate the elderly, wealthy people are than men results in this group of people to turn on each other with brusque voices. Although social class does not define an individual, it most certainly affects the way people form their judgment about others. So in Brooks' poem, the social class of both the fortunate neighborhood folks and the less fortunate speaker very much influences the assessment the speaker makes about the more fortunate folks. The speaker believes these higher class individuals have a swagger about them that cannot be ignored that we may look at them in their gardens where the summer ripeness rots, but not ragged. Even the leaves fall down in lovelier patterns here. This swagger is also represented through the excellent corpses these affluent people make among the expensive flowers. Regardless of the mocking tone the speaker uses throughout this poem, as well as in the previous lines I just read, he or she does, not, he or she does realize that there's a distinct, significant difference between the two social classes. This difference is not only demonstrated through material items such as fancy cars or expensive houses possessed by the rich people, it is also represented by the lower social class's lack of these possessions during their entire lifetime. Additionally, since the speaker's categorization of social class falls in a lower branch, it is also depicted by jealousy. We do not want them to have less, but it is only natural that we should think we have not enough. Due to the fact that the speaker of the poem is not one of the financially well-off individuals who resides in an upper social class is most likely the reason why he or she is portrayed as resentful. Similarly, it is also probably why the speaker uses a mocking tone when describing his or her views of the people in a higher social class. Ironically, as I earlier mentioned, the name of the poem is Beverly Hills, Chicago, suggesting a higher social class resides here. Beverly Hills is a wealthy neighborhood in Southern California, and it signifies that the name of a neighborhood serves as a marker of social class. The affluent neighborhood being described in the poem um, has the same name as this neighborhood in Southern California, and it serves as a hint to which audience, to, it serves as a hint to the audience as to which kind of social classes reside here. Switching gears here, in um, Diaz's short story, How to Date a Brown Girl, Black Girl, White Girl, Happy, the narrator's account of the girl's social class affects the way teenage boys will choose to present themselves on their first date. The narrator begins the story by stating, clear the government cheese from the refrigerator. If the girl's from the terrace, stack the boxes behind the milk. If she's from the park or society hill, hide the cheese in the cabinet above the oven, way up where she'll never see. So from the start of the story, it's made clear that the girl's social class will influence how the how she judges a boy, merely how he presents the cheese in the house. And you don't know me, subjectivity and objectivity, in Junior Diaz's short story, How to Date a Brown Girl, Black Girl, White Girl, or Happy, Casey Tortenson, a scholar, scholarly writer, emphasizes the main, a main point of the story, the generalization that an individual's own judgments of another person are determined by that individual's biased interpretations about a person's social class. Similarly, the narrator, and he has a short story, makes the assumption that the girl's father is a tough guy due to his profession. He sounds like a principal or police chief, the sort of dude with a big net, who never has to watch his back. This assumption is based primarily off his social class, even though the boy had never met this man. He's only heard his voice over her phone. Additionally, the social class of the narrator will also have an effect on the girl with whom he's asked on the date. For example, the narrator inhibits in the less safer part of town, therefore leading to the conservative attitude of the girl's parents. Neither of them want her seeing any boys from the terrace. People get stabbed in the terrace. The girl's parents are skeptical and hesitant to let their daughter go on a date with a boy from this ghetto part of the town because of, they're not because they're concerned with her safety and make the assumption that she will not be in a good situation with this boy based on the assumptions of his social class. This assumption, the assumption the girl's parents make leads to the intersection between social class and geographic location. If the boy are from Park Hill, Park or Society Hill, connotations generally associated with prosperity, safety, and wealth, then the girl's parents wouldn't have the same sense of skepticism. In the essay, In and Out of the Mainstream, Dominican American Identity in Junit Diaz's short story, How to Date a Brown Girl, Black Girl, White Girl, Happy, literary critic Daniel Batista believes the narrator's suggestions as to the effects the boy's social class and race will have on the girl he's going on a date with is foolishly racist proposition on its face. 
So although racist may be too extreme of an accusation to define the situation, the more accurate thing to say, rather, people categorize or typecast social, class, and race together. The assumptions and generalizations an individual makes about another person based on their social class and race is considered bigoted. bigoted. However, in most cases, these dogmatic assumptions individuals make in regards to social class may be plausible. For example, the girl's parents' postulations about the daughter not being safe in a neighborhood where people get stabbed is very possible and understandable. Similarly speaking, if the boy were white, as well as from an affluent neighborhood such as the one described in Gwendolyn Brooks' Beverly Hills, Chicago, the girl's parents would most likely have no problems or concerns about their daughter's safety. Social class is known for being one of the leading, if not chief culprit of the indicators people use to prematurely judge others based on their outward appearances. Social class is a characteristic every individual is granted and will most likely stay with them for long periods of time. That being said, these point of judgments people make are hard to argue with, even though some may be racist or plain unfair. Whether judging a book by its cover, metaphorically speaking about social class is immoral or unjust, every individual on the planet does it as is part of human nature. These satirical yet meaningful judgments are an inherent part of human nature and features we must learn to accept and manage.
task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. That's Acts 20:24. 20, the prophecy that Christ would be the branch of Jesse, a well-known figure of the Old Testament, certainly would have been good news to all who heard it. Because the Antiphon writers lived only centuries after Christ's life, they were driven to inform others that he would return in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised and perishable, and we will all be changed. 1 Corinthians 15, 52. The fourth Antiphon, O God is David, is a reminder that only Christ holds the keys to heaven, or the key of the house of David. The slower pace of the Antiphon acts as a relief after the rushing over of Jesse. Perhaps the subject matter of Christ as the opener of heaven is meant to be the climax of the eight Advent Psalms. O Papa's David is an appropriate transition into O Orient's meaning, O Radiant Dawn. After Christ opens heaven, the splendor of eternal light glimmers exquisitely in the new voices in aleatoric fashion. The voices that sing the next antiphon, O Rex Gentium, cry out to the King of all the nations. This is the King feared by Jeremiah and worshipped by Daniel and all nations and peoples. The crystal clear ascent and Crescendo of the Sopranos on Gentium is followed by an inviting, calming crescendo. It is strange that the first verse of the popular song, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, is taken from the final antiphon, originally sung on the last day of the concluding week. In the Chilcot composition, O Emmanuel sounds as though it is most true to the original chant. When reading along with the text, the Latin is quite precise. The opening phrase, O Emmanuel, mimics the reverence and adoration of the Latinite. The text translation is simpler than that of the world of him. O Emmanuel, King and Lawgiver, Desire of the Nations, Savior of all people, come and set us free, Lord our God. This text is well known because it is a fervent request answered by a proven, compelling promise. The Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and we'll call him Emmanuel, Isaiah 7.14. Emmanuel, or Emmanuel, combines two words in the original Hebrew. Emmanuel, meaning with us, and El, meaning God, God with us. Emmanuel is but one appellation for God's Son, this word of comfort for those whose hearts are on pilgrimage. This promise of Emmanuel, God with us, is still the fervent hope of all Christian men, keeping watch for Jesus to return, as it says in 1 Thessalonians 5.2, like a thief in the night. The seven note antiphons collectively have origins in the reign of Charlemagne, roughly 771 to 814 AD. It is possible that they were derived from the writings of the poets of old. The writers of the Antiphons lived hundreds of years after the birth of Christ. It is easy to imagine them listening to their grandparents pass on accounts of the nativity. Whatever the exact date of composition, the composers knew that the prophecies and hopes of which they wrote had already been fulfilled. They waited and hungered for the Messiah just as their ancestors did. It is healthy and sacred to await the birth of Christ each year with anticipation and repentant hearts like the writers of the Antiphons. These writers were intensely expected for Christ to come to earth again at any moment. This hope gave Advent an element, an element of mystery and wonder with which no other season quite compares. It is a holy practice, and it does not have to be more than a dreary. While people do walk in darkness and shadows, those who see the light of the King of Kings can wait with glimmers of excitement, knowing that their heart's desires will be fulfilled. It is no accident that the initials of each antiphon, S-A-R-C-O-R-E, Spell a life-changing promise when read backwards. Aerocraz, I will be with you tomorrow. The wonder of Aerocraz is the fact that the statement at once looks backward and forward. Christians can see that God was faithful to the promises of Emmanuel because he came to earth to be with us. Simultaneously, those who believe have great hope and assurance that Christ will be with us again at a time which no human can predict. These antiphons were likely saved for the final week of Advent to heighten the suspense felt by congregations of both the birth of Christ and the second coming. This week of the Advent season is meant to reflect the, the Christ's incarnation. By singing about the wisdom and holiness of the Lord, it is easy to visualize Mary as a young mother holding her son and father all at once. Our sin and shame is covered by his pure love as both man and baby. This is caused to continue the inner joy commemorated in the third week of Advent. The origins of O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, the seed of the Antiphons, have been questioned since 1881. It is most likely that the hymn first appeared in the 13th century. John Mason Neal translated Benny Benny Emmanuel in 1851, first publishing it with Thomas Helmore and Pimlow noted in 1854, using the revised text from 1853. After Neal's death, Helmore alleged that the tune was copied from a French missile, not the National Library of Lisbon, as Neal had claimed. In 1966, Mary Berry discovered the tune in another French source, a 15th century Franciscan processional, which was probably copied for another. This melody was also sung to a text, 
Viverame Domine, as a burial procession in Benetton style, familiar melody on the left and counter melody on the right, further deciding the French origin. The melody of O Come, O Come, Emmanuel is haunting. It has a way of stirring the soul into an emotional flashback of God's faithfulness to his people. The hymn is frequently sung in the key of E minor. The minor mode has a different effect on each listener, but it carries a weight that a major key does not usually hold. An opening minor, minor triad on the words, O Come, O Come, or with any thing, shows the urgency with which Israel longs to be ransomed. The human soul can empathize with the Israelites' need to be free from bondage. The mood of the first verse changes with the words, until the Son of God appears. The sweet, constant sound of rejoice fits this shift of mood. The, rep the re repetition of rejoice in every stanza reflects the constant hope that the Lord will come. The moving text of the antiphons are encapsulated into a sacred, heartwarming story of just one piece. The conclusion. Just like the writers of these ancient texts, we should simultaneously look back and look forward. We look at the faithfulness of God through the ages and the faithfulness of God in life itself. We remember first hearing the story of Christ's birth forever, forever blessed and our first understanding of his sacrifice for us on the cross. We then visualize the moment we accept God's free gift of salvation. Looking ahead is just as beneficial as looking back. As individuals, we look at who we are in Christ and the hopes we have in a relationship with him. We recognize the human flaws we need to work on and we pray that God will mold us as we wish us. The church, too, can participate in this process. The congregation should rejoice in what God has done in the life of the church and prepare for what he will do in the future. When I look back on my life, I want to know confidently that I'm making the best use of my time while I wait for Christ to return. So I sing to him now and forever, as it says in the hymn of the Father's love be God. One day, everything on earth will worship the Father. Every voice in concert reign, evermore and evermore.
and uh, I worked a little bit in conjunction with my professor for that class and with Dr. Collins. Um, I, mine was also from the class. Um, I'm a part of an interdisciplinary honors program at Valencia, and we specifically have a really broad focus on the humanities. And um, Professor Frame over there um, <coughs> suggested Kafka on the Shore for us as a common read. So um, in a way, <laughs> it was for class, and in a way, I never got to write a paper on it for that class the way that I liked. And other Valencia students can attest to the fact that I kind of obsessed over this book for a mm -hmm. while. <laughs> so, and um, and, and um, now I got the chance to write this this, this book, and um, it was a lot of fun doing personal research. Um, I need like a board and have like sticky notes with string on it and everything. Um, it, it was it was awesome fun, but definitely an honors paper. Mine is also for a class, my interdisciplinary honors class at Valencia for last spring semester. We were given um, it was a an assignment for a research paper and it had to be about the Renaissance. Now that could be literature, it could be art, or there were other choices. And so the student was given independent choice and then we reported back with what we wanted to do and then we were allowed to go with that. And as soon as I heard the assignment, I was like, I saw this painting once in the loop and I want to see if it's going to meet the criteria. And I brought my book with me today, actually. And I looked it up and I'm like, yes, it's Renaissance art. This was my choice. And so I went with that. And um, it was a great paper. I loved it. It gave me a lot of free reign to do it the way I wanted, but it was a very structured assignment as well. And I, I just came up with so much information about the painting and I learned so much about art from the work, from doing the research. I loved it. Yeah. 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 Yeah.